chairman of the governing board of the NPI, the visiting president of the Commonwealth of Lani, A. Maraj, directors from the Commonwealth of Lani, in the passing of Al Haji Hafiz Wali and Mr. John Quigley, staff of the National Teachers Institute, Kaduna, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my pleasure and a privilege to welcome Dr. James A. Maharaj, President of the Commonwealth of Lanin, on the second leg of his visit to Africa, and indeed his first to Nigeria and the National Teachers Institute in Kaduna. The President of the Commonwealth of Lanin, we are aware of the temporary setback which your country Trinidad, is now experiencing. I therefore wish to extend my sincere sympathy and that of the entire staff of the National Teachers Institute for the current happening in Trinidad. We pray Almighty Allah to restore peace and tranquility to your country. The National Insti Teachers Institute attaches great importance to your visit in many respects. First, the Institute is solely established for the purpose of distance learning system to assist the teeming population of the young men and women of this country who are yearning for further education. In the second vein, so in the same vein, your organization happened to be established purposely to facilitate broader opportunity for young men and women throughout the Commonwealth to improve themselves academically. The cordial relationship which exists between Nigeria and the Commonwealth of Learning, and indeed between the National Teachers Institute and the Commonwealth of Learning, have been growing from strength to strength. First, Nigeria is one of the main voluntary contributors to the development of the Commonwealth of Learning. Second, the pioneer director of this institute, Al Haji Hafiz Wali, is now a staff member of your agency. And third, my humble self, sir happens to be a member of the Board of Governors of your agency. With this connection, we regard your visit as an extension of our friendship and an opportunity for you to see for yourself what we have been talking about on distance learning of the National Teachers Institute Kaduna. Because of the time factor, it is not possible to show you all the programs, structures and developments of the NTI. However, we shall try to acquaint you important aspects that you wish or you may wish to know during your one-day stay in Kaduna. You should please permit me to give you a short brief on the National Teachers Institute. First, the function of the Institute. As I mentioned earlier, the National Teachers Institute Kaduna was established by the Federal Government of Nigeria in 1976 as an institution to train teachers throughout the distance learning system through the distance learning system. This was done in response to a dire need to produce teachers of the right caliber and in adequate numbers to man the nation's primary schools. There was also a felt need to do this outside the conventional institution so that teachers could upgrade themselves educationally and professionally while remaining on their jobs. The need becomes more urgent as government had earlier launched the Universal Primary Education, popularly known as UPE program, which increased markedly the population of pupils in our schools. Decree number seven of 1978, which established the Institute, formally summarizes its functions as follows. One, to upgrade underqualified and untrained teachers. Two, to provide refresher and other upgrading courses for teachers. And three, to organize workshops seminars and conferences which would assist in the improvement of teachers. On the basis of these functions stipulated for the Institute, its focus initially was to assist needed teachers throughout the nation to obtain the teacher's grade two certificates, which was the traditional qualification demanded from teachers in primary schools. In 1979, however, government promulgated a national policy on education which, among other things, prescribed that the Nigeria Certificate in Education 
will eventually be the minimum qualification for teachers in the primary schools. Continues to run Teacher Grade 2 by DLS for those teachers who still need the program. It has also mounted a new program of NCE, which is the Nigeria Certificate in Education by DLS, to enable others obtain the required certificate. The program has been launched in virtually all the states of the Federation, and so far, about 32,000 teachers approximately have registered for this course. Over the years also, the Institute was given some ancillary assignments, including the following. The conduct of TC2 examination nationwide in the five centrally examined subjects, i.e. education, English language, mathematics, integrated science, and social sciences, uh, social studies. The conduct of teachers' census in primary and post-primary institutions throughout the nation was also added to the task of the NTI. This has led to the production of national teachers' registers showing both relevant data on teacher population and some salient information on each teacher. These registers are available for you, Mr. President, and your team for inspection on your way out. And the third one, the annual conduct of the interview examination for the candidates wishing to enter the junior secondary schools in the nation's unity schools. This assignment was also given to the National Teachers Institute, and happily enough, the Institute has been carrying out this assignment with success. I now turn to the organization of the Institute. As it may please you to note that for the purpose of carrying out its functions, the Institute is organized as follows. The directorate. The directorate, as the name implies, is headed by the director, who is also the chief executive of the institute, and department comprises several units, which include computer com type setting units, estate division, information and publications unit, facilities, which is media resources center, including the library, audiovisual aids, etc., internal audit, and the printing press. We have the administration and the personnel department, which is headed by the registrar, basically providing administrative support for the various operations of the institute. It is also divided into two major units, namely personnel and general administration, handling all personnel matters, including staff recruitment, training, discipline, welfare, etc. And second is the council matters, which takes all necessary arrangements for meetings of the governing council of the institute and follow-up actions on decision taken at such meetings. Third department is the professional and field operations department. This department is headed by a deputy director who is responsible for the development and management of the institute distance learning system. It comprises three units, namely the professional operations, which belongs, uh, develops all NTI's courses, uh, course materials using the workshop system, essentially. Second, the institute's distance learning system in the field and study centers throughout the federation. And third, this education for serving teachers of various categories through workshops, seminars, conferences, etc. The fourth department is the examinations department. Principally, the department is headed by the deputy director who is responsible for the conduct, marking, and release of results of examinations conducted by the NTI. The department comprises essentially three main units, namely the test development, which as its name implies, develops test items for the various examinations conducted by the institute. Second, test administration, which administers the actual conduct of the examinations. And third, the security printing, which requires records and statistics. The fourth department is the planning, research, and statistic department. The planning, research, and statistic department handles the initial planning, detailed modalities, and implementations, as well as costing of all of the NTI's academic programs. The department consists of three sections, namely statistics and records, 
programs, schedules, research and evaluation. The department is headed by a deputy director. The sixth is the accounts department. The accounts department manages the accounts of the institute. It is, head, it is headed by a financial controller, now the assistant director of finance, who is responsible directly to the director and the chief executive. The department has three main units, namely administration and management information, finance and accounting, budget costing and stores. In addition to the six departments mentioned above, the institute has an office in the capital of each state of the federation and the federal capital territory of Abuja. Each state office is headed by a state coordinator who handles the operation of the institutes in the state. Then we have the physical facilities of the institute. Mr. President, I wouldn't like to burden you with naming of all the facilities that are available in the institute, as you are likely to see a lot of these when you go around at the end of this meeting. However, it is my pleasure to mention the few, uh, a few of them. These are the normal office buildings situated, uh, as you can see, in all around the modern printing press, which you will see after we go, uh, going out, the computer, computer setting outfit, the audio-visual and photographic unit, library, language laboratory, and the conference center where we are now. Staff of the Institute. The staff of the Institute, both at the headquarters and the state offices, now numbered about 852. The present challenges. The present challenges facing the institute includes the need to build the various schools mentioned in the decree establishing the institute, namely the School of General Studies, School of Advanced Studies, and School of Educational Innovation. These are yet to be developed, and it is the intention of this institute and the management to forge ahead and see that these schools are provided as finances could permit. Then intensive effort also to improve and upgrade thousands of teachers in our primary school and junior secondary school will continue. In this direction, you and your team may wish to know the following developments, Mr. President, that since the establishment of the institute, and the time it has taken the registration of teachers for distance learning, it has, in a short note, got nearly one million candidates who registered for the examination. I said nearly one, uh, one million because so far we have 940,578 who registered from 1982 to 1989. And this year alone we have 51,000 485 who registered for the 1990 examinations. This gives us just a little under 1 million. However, the total number who actually set for the examination, excluding the, uh, this year's registered students, is 852,643. The total number that have passed so far is 301,007. Mr. President, as you have listened to me in Banjul, the Gambia last week, you can see the figures I have mentioned here include also those who have been in teachers' colleges. If we were to separate these, we can humbly say about 186,000 have gone through the doors of the distance learning, while the others who are students in teachers' colleges, but using the NTI system. Books for print for the DLS. This activity creates a lot of requests for books throughout the year. This is for the National uh, Nigeria Certificate in Education, which has just been introduced, and the teachers, uh, TC2 examinations. In all, the institute has committed nearly 11.7 million naira 
on the printing of books and other materials for the candidates so far. With this, Mr. President, I think I will give opportunity to some of the directors to acquaint you with a bit of the activities of their departments before we go around to see the departments physically. I will now have the pleasure of asking the director, the deputy director, professional operation to say a few words about his departments and we go from there to the next director as I will call them later. Mr. President of the call, Chairman of the National Teachers Institute Council, Director, other distinguished guests, my colleagues, it is an honor to be called upon to speak very briefly on the Professional and Field Operations Department. Our department, as you have been told, is responsible for two major activities. One is the development of course materials for the distance learning system, and the other is the administration and management of the distance learning system itself. A third one, which I didn't consider as major, uh, is in-service uh, education. I say it's not major because uh, it looks to me like it's a subsidiary to these major functions of the Institute. Our course materials go through uh, a series of activities before we can uh, finally put them to the students in the field. There is the writing stage, which involves the development of the curriculum itself in the form of sequencing charts, the writing activity, which actually brings writers uh, from various higher institutions, editing, and sometimes critiquing. This ensures that the materials themselves are of a sufficient standard. I don't want to mention, of course, that even before these um, stages, that a lot of research you know, goes into uh, the writing and developing of the curriculum. So far, we have been concerned mainly with two areas. The upgrading program for unqualified teachers and the NCE DLS. The writing of the uh, books for the upgrading of the teachers unqualified grade two teachers, I would want to say is as old as the institute itself. I believe that it started uh, as soon as the institute uh, itself was um, established. That was the first assignment. So the writing of course materials, I, I believe, goes as far back as 1976. But the actual administration of the distance learning system started in 1984. We started our first lot of students numbering about 45,152. Ever since then, we have trained well over 195,513 teachers through. I must now mention, sir, the mode of administering this distance learning program. We have, as you know, 22, or shall I say 21, but including the Federal Capital Territory, we have 22 capitals in this country. And we have a state um, coordinator located in each one of these capitals. His responsibility is to ensure that the program reaches every student that desires it in that particular state. So we have 
22 coordinating offices, which we call uh, field centers. In each of these field centers, there is or there are a number of study centers. For the NCE DLS, we have at present 106 study centers. For the TC2 upgrading program, the number of study centers varies from year to year. But altogether, for the period that we have been running this program, that is since 1984, we have used altogether 1,104 study centers. Some of these centers, of course, may be the same. Uh, 145,725 books. Whereas in the NCE DLS program, we have distributed so far 102,889 books. The two programs employ essentially two methods of evaluation. One is a continuous assessment, and the other one is a final examination. Uh, incidentally, in the first one, that is the TC2 upgrading program, the final examination is the one conducted by the National Teachers Institute. I do hope also that the final examination for the NCE DLS program which we are doing will also be conducted by the National Teachers Institute Examinations uh, Department. Let me mention very briefly that in the in-service education programs, we have tried to reach serving teachers. Uh, most of them have been teachers who are working in our teacher training colleges. But I dare to say too that many of the teachers who are working in other secondary and sometimes tertiary institutions have found this program, uh, these programs useful and have benefited from it. By and large, what I would want to say here is that both the TC2 DLS upgrading program and the NCE program have produced one result that sometimes people do not mention, coordinated effort, which have a broad national outlook and which are acceptable throughout this country. This is one major uh, uh, achievement that I would want to think that the uh, distance learning system of the National Teachers Institute has made. With this, sir, uh, I do hope that you will have chance, uh, time to have a look at some of our programs and uh, at the books that are displayed at the door. Director, sir, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that's what I would like to say. The President, sir, I have now the honor to ask the Deputy Director exams to enlighten on the activities of his department. On NTI Council, Director, NTI Directors of co Colleagues. Um, as uh, the director has said, the exam department is made up of three major sections, test development, test administration, and the security printing, records and statistics. Our circle of activities under the new calendar year of the of a school system in Nigeria begins in January to February. This is usually the time after we have released the result of the previous year we advertise for candidates wanting to see for the examinations. And these candidates are usually in two categories. The group which are regular students in the teacher's colleges we call the internal candidates. Then the groups which are referred in one paper or the other we call the external candidates. And incidentally, the NTI students fall into the second category, external candidates. After these have registered for the exam, they fill various forms. We have been told that uh, we have state offices, so we have decentralized all our activities, and that makes it easier for us to conduct exam for a large country like Nigeria and for such a large number of uh, candidates. These candidates register in the various states, and their materials are brought to headquarters. I must say that over the years, we have computerized all our activities in examination matters, from registration to the release of results. And that has made it very possible for us to handle such a large number of uh, candidates at the same time. 
I reckon that maybe when we get to the computer center this afternoon, you are likely to see them working on some of such uh, forms we use. Have we registered the candidates? We pro produce the printouts from the computer center. We send to colleges to validate. That is to ensure that the number of candidates we say they have registered and the spelling errors and all must have been taken care of. When they have validated, they sent to us, and we now have a good list of registered candidates. The examination itself is divided into two se major sections. We have the oral part, and we have the written part. The oral part is essentially in English language. And uh, just coincidentally, yesterday was the beginning of the oral English examination in the various centers. We have centers stacked out all over the country, uh, country. We assemble teachers from various locations. We put them through our oral English procedures and they go into the field to do the exam. And this exam is usually conducted three months before, about three months before this main examination. Maybe briefly how we come about our questions, we organize the item writing workshop. We do this with practicing teachers, either at the TC2 level, the university level, or the colleges of education. We assemble them, they develop these test items, which we bring back here. Our subject officers do go through the age of editing, we call another editing team or moderating team to look at these questions. They now agree on various standards. The objective items, that is the multiple choice questions, we try to test, while the essay question we accept at, at uh, that level when they have been given to us. After the trial testing, we call another group to look at the results from the trial testing and now do a little modification where necessary. These items are now accepted into our bank. So we usually have a bank of uh, items. And development of an item could take up to two years when you go from stage to stage. That we are going to form a paper. I remember that uh, our former director used to help us, but we are not able to continue with that meanwhile. He uses his small micro in his office to give us a set of questions. At that stage, even the person going to print the question, he doesn't know what is going to come out. So as such a notice, he gives us a question paper, which we now take to camera. That helps us in reducing the number of hands that will touch a question paper and improves our security system. The security section of the department now takes over. And uh, from the highest to the lowest, we get involved and we ensure that whatever we are doing, we do it under security conditions. And we also transport these questions through security, uh, with using security vehicles. We had a radio communication system where we can talk to all our state offices. We are able to monitor the movement of our question papers because the country is large and uh, it might be very sad. If you are in Kaduna, you think the question has got to maybe Calabar, another end of the country. If you don't know, if something happens midway and the exam is supposed to be done at the same time all over the Federation, but with our communication system, we are able to monitor it. We rely so mainly on the state ministries of education to nominate supervisors for us to take charge of this examination. We do that because these supervisors are staff of the various ministries, and we expect they should do their best. If we find any supervisor not doing the right thing, we report him to his uh, employer. So with that, we are able to ensure the security of our papers and that the examinations are conducted under very good uh, conditions. We also send up our staff from the various offices, I mean from headquarters, to assist in the various offices. This is to act as an inspection team because we found over the years if we don't have our eye in each center, we may have situations we cannot explain. But we are able to monitor it and with the help of our law enforcement agencies, we ensure that nothing goes wrong. When the exams are conducted, we retrieve all the papers, we bring them back to Kaduna, we are now arranging for marking. Uh, the objective papers we uh, computer, I mean we scan where necessary, then the theory papers we have to physically mark before the question, the scores are fed into the computer again. And that one we organize in six zones. We have divided the country into zones. We assemble teachers from a particular zone to mark. But we ensure that papers from a particular zone is not being marked in that zone. That is to say there is sort of cross-zonal movement of scripts. This is to make sure that if I'm a teacher in a particular zone, I'm not likely to come across the script of my students. When they have finished marking, we now assemble the uh, materials back, the, the scores are recorded, and we go back to the computer center. They now take over in processing the result. Usually we have uh, irregular cases, one problem or the other. These are also investigated and taken care of. By the time they enter in, uh, we have done first, second, and third proofreading. 
we are reasonably sure that the scores recorded are correct. So we now call a meeting, we call an awards committee meeting. The, the function of this awards committee is to fix the grade points and as well to resolve the malpractice or irregular cases. Uh, that committee comprises uh, members from various parts of the country. I think the, I mean, the director of the institute is the chairman. We have representative of West African Examination Council, which is uh, another examining body, parastatals of the Federal Ministry of Education, and the chief examiners. We deliberately exclude, exclude the state ministries of education from that exercise. Um, uh, the university's institute of education also sent their directors to represent them. The ministry, state ministries of education are excluded simply because we want to be sure those who are taking decisions are not connected in any way with any of the students. With that method, we have been able to ensure that we get uniform standard from year to year. And since 1982, when we started this, we haven't had any major problem. And we really we handle five subjects nationally. The other papers are being handled by the various states. And we have a joint certification system. But NTI gives the certificate in conjunction with the state ministries of education. Um, one innovation which we introduced in the oral English procedure over the years has been as a teacher's institute, we said we are not only interested in examining and passing students, we also want to see how well our teachers are doing in the field. So in the oral English aspect, we, we worked out a system whereby the teacher testing the student in oral English has a way of also telling us what he has done. So we now record the performance of the teacher as well as the student. So in the school of, say, 100 uh, students, we arrange in such a way that the teacher, when he's assessing students, is able to record, put on cassette tapes about 10 of them. Those cassettes are brought back to us. And we now call experts in various uh, universities to come back and assess. We call it a vetting exercise. In other words, we are vetting the, the performance of the teacher in scoring the students. By that method, we have been able to find out the teacher who is very good, the teacher who needs a little brushing up before he goes for the next exercise. And that has helped tremendously in improving the teaching and learning uh, of uh, oral English in our schools. Thank you, Mr. President. The directors who are visiting with the President of all, um, deputy directors and colleagues. The Planning, Research, and Statistics Department is the newest. It came into being last June. I think one of the reasons why it was established was the fact that uh, the Federal Ministry of Establishment demanded that every um, parastatal or every department must have a planning, research, and statistics department. And so it became mandatory for the NTI to have one. Before then, other departments had been doing the work of the planning um, research and statistics uh, work. Now, since it came into being, we have been involved in collecting, collating, and ensuring that records and statistics are made available. In this regard, we have been uh, given the responsibility of collecting and updating the statistics for the registers, for the teachers' registers that you have over there. Uh, right now, we are working on um, collecting the data for the tertiary institutions in Nigeria, including the universities, the colleges of education, the polytechnics, and all other uh, teachers that are registrable in Nigeria. When we, have, we would have finished that assignment, we would have got all uh, registrable teachers registered in Nigeria. Um, the department also has what we call the program schedule unit, which uh, liaises with the professional departments in the institute, namely the professional and field operations and examinations department. We discuss um, academic matters and make sure that we are all thinking alike and that what we are doing is what we want, what, what is what is best for the country and for our students. The department is also responsible for research and evaluation. We feel that this is a very important aspect of our work because not only do we train the teachers who go into the field, 
but we want to monitor the activities in the classroom to make sure that the newly acquired knowledge or the knowledge they are acquiring from our um, training is put into practice. In this regard, we are very, very fortunate because our students are teachers. And so while they are learning, they are also teaching. And it is very important for us to find out what they are doing in the field. Now, this department has the major task of liaising with international bodies. And in this regard, we have been able to make contact with the UNESCO, the Open University, the Overseas Development Administration, and call. And right now, we have somebody from the Commonwealth Secretariat who is doing a case study of the Institute. And we do liaise with all these international people and uh, make sure that they get the right type of information they want. Our dream is to make sure that the National Teachers Institute is, a, uh, is made a first class distance establish, uh, education establishment and that we are looking forward to call to make it possible for us to have a kind of satellite village where we have all our modern uh, gadgets, electronics and what have you and we will be able to press the button and call Mr. President in Vancouver. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> which will be also available for the participants. I hope this is a center for excellence which will be used both nationally and internationally for various conferences and seminars. It offers an opportunity for the NTI and indeed the distance education system to facilitate these happenings which are now taking place not only in Nigeria but throughout the Commonwealth countries. I'm happy to say that perhaps in a few years, uh, in a few months to come, we are expecting some visitors from other member countries of the Commonwealth in West Africa. And we intend to use the facilities available intensively to assist other countries. I have purposely laid the introduction of the principal officers of the Institute, not only because you have met them at the airport, but I feel that to round up my welcome address, I need to show you to the left. We have the registrar, Mr. Ajayi. We have the deputy director, exams, Mr. Itama. We have a new lay, of course, taken up just about a week old, new assistant director of finance, Haji Bello Kawaji. We have also a new chief estate engineer in the past of Allah Haji Bature. A professional in field operation, Sir Francis Mutua. Next, not, uh, next, not next after him. <laughs> yes, he has not come up. Mrs. Bako, who is also the head of the Department of Planning, Research and Statistics. The other staff you see around the, around the table are all staff of various units, heads of various units that you are likely to meet as you go around. I feel there is no point of introducing them now, but when we go around the departments, we are likely to meet them. With this, Mr. President, I wish once more to welcome you and your team to the National Teachers Institute. I wish you a very happy stay with us and also very safe journey back to Vancouver, Canada. Thank you. Chairman of Council, Mr. Director, colleagues and friends, although this is the first time that we are physically present at the Institute, I feel as though we, we know something of the Institute for quite a while. And that, of course, is partly because on the first Board of Governors of the Commonwealth of Learning, we had uh, Al-Haji Hafiz Wali representing Nigeria. And he has been antecedents. Uh, people of the Caribbean have this very strong connection with West Africa, and also professionally, as I come out, as I said, at that stable. 
So it is a special delight, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Director, for me to be here. Perhaps I'd better try and say a thing or two about why we're here. We have an obligation, indeed it is our wish, that in shaping the programs in which the Commonwealth of Learning would be involved, that we should have very close consultation throughout the Commonwealth. We have been in business, if you like, for just over a year, really. I assumed duties in Vancouver in January of 89. The first professional member of staff arrived in July of that year. Alhaji Hafiz himself didn't come until last November, so he hasn't even done a year yet. So we are rather new. But although we are new, we feel that until we can talk face to face directly with the key people in the various Commonwealth countries, it is very difficult for us to determine not only how to interpret our mandate, but how we might execute that mandate in different countries. Indeed, I do not believe that education itself is a panacea for the problems of development with which we are all faced. I have said in other places that education might well be a necessary but not a sufficient condition for coping with the problems of development. There are many countries in which the level of education has increased remarkably in the last two decades and the development problems remain the same. So let us see the jobs which we have to do in their proper perspective. That, I believe, will derive from the nature of the consultations which we hold. Having begun the West African consultations in Gambia, we felt we should come to Nigeria specifically because Nigeria is a large country. Specifically because, as one of the founding members, if you like, of the Commonwealth of Learning, it has had a major financial and professional contribution to make. And also because I feel very strongly that it is high time that the rhetoric about South-South cooperation ceases and that action follows. This is not to say, Mr. Chairman, that there isn't much to be learned from the more developed countries. But it is to give due recognition to the fact that there is a great deal of benefit to be gained by a closer interaction among the developing countries. An interaction which I put before you has so far been underexploited. It struck me as I listened to the reports that perhaps I could share a moment usefully with you in trying to clarify the mandate which Call has. Because we would want to regard this institute as one of the prime institutions with which we are working. <laughs> Another institution that falls into that category is the Indira Gandhi National University in New Delhi. Indeed, I hope that there can be a close link between the Indira Gandhi National University, which is an open university, and this institution and other institutions in the network in Nigeria. And I believe that unless you understand and appreciate how we have interpreted the mandate, then the nature of our own interaction cannot be fulfilled. I said earlier this afternoon, when we paid a courtesy call on the military governor, that the stimulus which gave rise to the creation of the Commonwealth of Learning was the introduction of economic fees in some of the major metropolitan centers. 
it was the introduction of those fees which led to a decline in the number of students going overseas for higher education that caused the setting up of the Committee on Student Mobility. From which committee, or from which committee's work, heads of government eventually agreed to create the Commonwealth of Learning. Having said that, let me make it very clear that whereas because of that genesis, the expectation was that we would concentrate on higher education, we are not making higher education the primary focus of our work. Because in the discussions which we have carried out with government, what governments have been saying to us is that their interest is in the development of human resources. And the development of human resources is not the prerogative of higher education. There's a whole range of institutions concerned with the development of human resources. Let us take as an example Namibia, which has recently become independent and joined the Commonwealth as its 50th member. If in Namibia, the development of human resources puts as a priority literacy for returning refugees, then the Commonwealth of Learning If in many of the countries, the development of human resources places technical and vocational education at the height of its priorities, then we must do that. Equally, if in another country, the gaps seem to be in the higher education sector, a sector incidentally from which the major development agencies appear now to be averting their gaze. Many of the major institutions are now claiming that it is primary education. Far be it from me to challenge any of those assumptions. But it is the right of governments to determine in their own country whether resources are going to be channeled towards one sector or towards another, or whether they will invest differentially in a number of sectors, because progress in these countries cannot take place evenly across all the sectors. Of course, we have a board of governors on which Dr. Bonza sits. They have established priorities. We meet key officials, we meet political leaders, and we get an indication from them as to what we ought to be doing. And when I shake all of this out, like a bag of coals, if you shake it, and see what is left, after all the dust and so on comes out, or as I've said in some other places, when all of the excess baggage disappears, <coughs> what are you left with? You're left with a mandate that requires you to help increase access to education. You're left with a mandate that wants you to help improve the quality of education a mandate that addresses human resources development. So that we are not living only in the education sector. If agricultural extension becomes the important thing, we will do that. If it's primary health care, we will do that. But we do it through distance education techniques. And central to distance education techniques is the convergence between the new technologies and the demands of education. So your plea for a satellite village does not fall on deaf ears. <laughs> John Quigley is not hard of hearing, and I am sure that when you have an opportunity later, you'll be able to take that proposal further forward. Let me make the point, however, that the Commonwealth of Le Learning is not addicted to high technology. I tend to be rather pragmatic and a realist in these matters. Over 70% of the materials used in distance education today are still print-based materials. And if in any given country it's print, so be it. If it's a question of using audio tapes to supplement, we will do that too. We are not, I'm not here 
as a salesman with a little black box asking you to buy certain forms of technology. Nonetheless, in a country like Nigeria, with its vast population and with many needs needing to be met in a short time, we must look quite hard at the use of mass communication in certain instances or we will not reduce the gap which exists. So that, in a sense, is our mandate. And that is what we're trying to do. All organizations have to have a president. Somebody has got to uh, answer the telephone. <laughs> but apart from myself, there is a vice president. And now that I'm in Nigeria, the vice president is looking after the shop. But we have, in terms of our own structure, uh, five directors with the vice president also serving as a director in that context. We have used a peculiar structure. Each director has a geographical responsibility and he also has a functional responsibility. So let me illustrate from the director you know best. Uh, and Haji Hafiz Wali has responsibility at this stage for African programs. In that role, he's assisted by Peter Kinanjui from Kenya. And at the moment, Peter seems to be doing more in East, Central, and Southern, while Al Haji Hafiz is going to concentrate his attentions on the West. But the overall responsibility is his. So that's his geographical responsibility. In addition to that, he has responsibility for information services, which I might say, in deference to him, almost in mitigation, is perhaps the most difficult of the functional areas with which we are currently concerned because of our funding pattern. I will come back to that in a moment. So that's Africa. Professor Ram Reddy, three times the Vice Chancellor, is responsible for Asia, and for training. Dr. Dennis Irvin, former Vice Chancellor of the University of Guyana and uh, member of the United Nations University and so on, is responsible for Caribbean programs and for materials acquisition and development. Peter McMeekin, who comes from New Zealand, handles the Pacific as well as professional continuing education. I don't think I've left anyone out. No. <laughs> I was talking about directors with functional and geographical responsibilities. Of course, this stranger here, John Quigley, um, spans the whole lot. John's responsibility for technology and telecommunications will be in support of all, all of the directors both in terms of geography and in terms of their functional matters. Because if you're dealing with information services, there's a technology component. If you're dealing with materials development, there's a technology component. So John is indispensable to the law. That kind of structure makes each of them a king geographically. So when you have problems in West Africa, don't ask me. <laughs> but they are less than kings functionally. So that if any of the other directors want to deal with matters concerned with information, they'll have to go to Hafiz. If he wants to deal with matters concerning training, he has to go and consult Professor Reddy and so on. So we have developed a collegial team in which, while in one sense they act independently in the geographical territorial division, they cannot act independently in the functional division. They have to act collegially. That gives you a feel of, of how we are structured. It also gives you a feel of the kinds of things on which we put emphasis. We put emphasis on information services, on training, on materials acquisition and, and development, on communications and technology, and interestingly, on professional continuing education. 
And I'll tell you why we have done that. I don't know, Mr. Director, what kinds of problems you run into in your interaction with the academic fraternity. But let us be under no misapprehensions. Whenever you try to develop an alternative system, like one based squarely on open learning or distance learning, there will inevitably be problems associated with what the academics call parity of esteem. How good is the program that you are putting on through a distance modality when compared with, with the conventional? And the problems associated with senates and academic boards and all of that kind of thing, a jungle in which I lived for over 10 years, then you have to find other ways of addressing those issues. I have a strong feeling and it will not happen in my lifetime, that the time will come, possibly within this decade, when people are going to ask whether what is happening in the conventional institution match what is happening in the open learning institution. Because at the moment, somebody goes into a lecture room and performs and leaves. There is no means by which you can assess the efficacy of that. But when you produce your materials, everybody can go through those materials in every way to find out whether this matches up. And the other, the other difficulties that are creeping into academic life, I am an academic too, but I share with you as colleagues some of the problems you have to face in this difficult job you do. The question of parity of esteem is one that will continue to bug open learning systems for a while until we are able to ensure that the quality of what we're doing is like Caesar's wife above reproach. There is no substitute, Mr. Director, none, for quality. And in distance education, you will do yourselves, your individual reputations, and the entire movement, if I can call it that, tremendous harm if you settle for less than high quality. It is better not to put the program on than to put it on in a way that allows people to make general criticisms which then have an influence across the whole business of open learning and distance education. I have recently heard the chairman of the University Grants Committee in India put an argument with which I, I, I must say I have more than little sympathy. It is perhaps an idea whose time has not yet come, but I'll share it with you. He asked open universities not to try and do what the conventional universities were doing. He argued that the countries were already disenchanted, were unsatisfied with what was coming out of conventional institutions that the development tasks of the country were not being addressed by those institutions. And therefore, open universities were being created to do other things. There may be the germ of some truth there. I would not be surprised if within this decade, the funding patterns for higher education change in such a way that open learning institutions receive a larger share because the delivery systems in which they are engaged are much more open to scrutiny. When people tell me about accountability and when they tell me 
The distance education is second rate, if not second best, because you're not sitting at the feet of someone. I ask myself, who is doing the teaching in the conventional institutions? And if you look at it quite hard, the senior most, the most able, are not involved in the instructions, in instructional tasks. A lot of the instruction is being left to the junior most, because that is a culture in which you publish or you perish. <laughs> I thought I should share these few thoughts, Mr. Director, with, with colleagues, because the way we evolve as a commonwealth of learning will have implications for a lot of what you are doing here nationally. Let me say that the two basic premises on which we were founded was the faith that heads of government have. They said that among Commonwealth countries, there must be a lot of material and there must be a lot of experience and expertise. So if you could only put it together, everybody would not have to remake the wheel. That was what they were saying. And heads of government, being heads of government, and people <coughs> whom we must accord the highest respect, were right, but right only up to a point. In the sense that the fact that you say materials exist does not mean that they are available. Culture of intellectual property. The belief that from all countries we will be able easily to mobilize this material has not proved within our experience to be the case. If the present patterns of funding continue or get extended, in which funding is tied to the goods and services of particular countries, that will provide a further constraint. But fortunately, Brunei, Nigeria, India, Canada, and several other countries, now totaling 22, have provided the kind of core budget that will enable to hold hands with you and make some of this happen. It is for that reason, Mr. Chairman, that I would like to encourage the, the director to take through call from other countries, such materials as we are happy to make available to him, and also to share your own materials with others. That will be testimony that the developing countries are prepared to help themselves. Let me, because I'm so comfortable and at home, put two other thoughts to you. With the first, I will take a certain liberty. But I know, because you've been so generous and so warm in your welcome, that you will accept it in the spirit in which I make it. And I want to encourage you to look ahead. Each person brings to a new position a new range of talents, new kinds of experiences. The talents that al Haji Hafiz gave to you, he now gives to us. And under Dr. Bunza's stewardship, I hope that NTI, building on the gains of the past, will see itself as entering a new era, so that the programs on which you now engage will take off, building on the past, but also facing the challenges that are different. As I listened to some of the reports, Director, I couldn't help as a professional myself reflecting on the fact that teacher education, which is the number one problem in every Commonwealth country today, wherever we have been, systems are coming apart. In fact, in the consultation last week in Gambia, 
the percentages were almost the same. In nearly all of the country, 60% of the teaching force at primary level is untrained. In a number of others, at secondary level, graduates without professional training and so on. I, I, I mustn't run a seminar. But let me say that it is an area of professional interest which throughout the Commonwealth is raising new problems. And I have a feeling that NTI can, in the next decades, develop for itself an image beyond Nigeria and perhaps provide some lessons for other developing countries if you will not only continue in the ways you're doing, but begin to look at some of the problems, perhaps with slightly different lenses. You've made a case for a satellite village. So be it. Maybe, maybe, don't start wanting to do the technology. But if in order to improve the quality of a given program, a technology may be applied that will make it more effective, why not? Let me challenge you to rethink the emphasis which we have all placed on skills required of a classroom practitioner. If you can turn your thoughts back a little to the 50s, when the first Sputnik went up, all teacher education programs began to emphasize the subject matter. We have lost a generation of people who, as teachers, were community developers. And what we have produced is a generation of teachers as classroom practitioners, perhaps more competent to transmit information and material. Perhaps. We have inherited a generation in which it seems as if people are going to go into teaching if they can't find anything else to do. It seems as if, whereas at a previous time, the cut from our own societies of the kind of people who went in is very different from the kind of people going in now. Now, are there not implications there for what we do in teacher education? And if that is so, then I believe, Mr. Director, that there is sufficient talent in this room to begin to look anew at the kinds of programs which you will yourself develop over the next decade. And you will demonstrate a quality of thinking and an approach that is born of your own confidence, from which many others might benefit. If that, Mr. Director, becomes the norm through which you seek to operate, let me, as the President of the Commonwealth of Learning, give you the assurance that we'll walk every mile along the way with you. And let me say also, as I worked very quickly through the figures that you presented, that it is significant than the eight years on which you have reported, the pass rate has been of the order of 35%. And that if you discount the highest figure of 68% in 1983, and the lowest figure of 25.9 in 1988, that pass rate drops to 30%. I do not draw your attention to this, Mr. Director, for reasons of criticism, because graciousness dictates otherwise. But we have to do better. We cannot only improve access. 
we have to improve quality. And we have to make sure that those who will follow the lines which we direct are worthy of the certification and worthy of the profession to which they're called. I'm delighted to say that the Commonwealth of Learning has made provision for three senior uh, professionals from the Gambia and from Sierra Leone to come and spend time with you here, to look at your materials, and to benefit from, from those in terms of their own programs. They will not be the only ones who will come. If at any stage you feel that as you take up the reins and as we keep Al Haji Hafiz Wali busy in Vancouver, that this institution in which the country has such great faith is one which, with our help, we hope will become a model for the Commonwealth developing countries. I thank you. Members of the Executive Council, Director, Chairman of Council, colleagues and friends. Uh, may I say, sir, that the Commonwealth Heads of Government, uh, just about two years ago, when they met in Vancouver, decided that it was important to establish a new international organization, primarily concerned with promoting the development of human resources through distance education. I think the stimulus for this was the fact that a large number of people from the third world countries who used to be able to go to the metropolitan countries for higher education found that they could no longer do so in large numbers because of the introduction of economic fees. That was the main motive. And uh, in the course of the deliberations which heads of government engaged in, they came to the conclusion that no country, developed or developing, will be able to meet the increasing demands for access to education, higher education, as well as other forms of education, or in fact improve the quality of education, unless they turned increasingly to distance education. Because we cannot build more colleges, more universities, use more resources and so on. And that was what led to the birth of the Commonwealth of Learning, which I have the privilege to head. I think an interesting feature of its development is the fact that for the first time, the major resources were provided by the developing countries themselves. And in that regard, Nigeria led the way. Nigeria has a very strong uh, financial commitment and a professional commitment to the Commonwealth of Learning. And as you would know, sir, perhaps fortuitously, the Commonwealth Secretariat itself is currently headed by one of your distinguished sons. So as a Commonwealth servant of long standing, it gives me particular pleasure to be in Nigeria at this time. We have just held a major consultation of the West African countries, beginning in Gambia. And I'm delighted to say that it was a highly successful meeting. Successful in the sense that the sub-region appears ready to work together in the kinds of activities <coughs> which we've been able to put before them. It is a special delight to be in Kaduna State, from which we have been able to draw the talents of Al Haji Hafiz Wali, um, Dr. Bunza's immediate predecessor. But also because the major problem which many of the third world countries seem to be facing today derive from the problems of teacher education. In a strange kind of way, despite all of the efforts over the last 10 years, in nearly every situation, it is teacher education that people are calling for. 
And your own institute here has developed a very enviable reputation because you have now trained nearly 200,000 teachers using distance. So we have come here to learn. We have also come to help in whatever way we can. And I'm delighted that my colleagues who are here and those who have remained behind have pledged themselves in this new enterprise to give attention to the priorities which governments themselves determine. We do not come with any prescriptions. We do not come with any priorities of our own. To the extent, therefore, that it can be of service, we will be delighted to do so. And I'm most grateful to you for your courtesy in receiving us and for giving me this opportunity on behalf of the Commonwealth of Learning to make a few remarks. Thank you. The president and the director of uh, directors of uh, College of Learning in Vancouver, Canada, the chairman and the director of National Teachers Institute, Kaduna, the commissioner for education and medical information, and all the press. Government and people of Kaduna State more sincerely extend on behalf of all of us our warm congratulations to Dr. James Maraj on his appointment as the first president of these very important institution. Same goes for all others who are now regarded as the pioneer staff of this institution, which hopefully in the future will not only attain the very objectives for which it was set resulting from the decision of the various heads of Commonwealth nations some two years ago, but also to become a model for developing nations to be able to set up certain institutions having similar motives towards the betterment of their own people. Secondly, I would like to acknowledge and also appreciate the kindness you have done by paying a courtesy call on the office of the military governor of the state and for being so generous to spend some days in our midst. And thirdly, for the most humble comments you have made on the National Institute based here in Kaduna, which they hitherto had had of Haji Hafiz Wali as the director before his nomination by the Nigerian government to become one of the pioneer staff representing Nigeria. You have very extensively briefed all of us here seated on what the Commonwealth College of Learning is, how it came about, and how you set about doing precisely what the objective of this institute should be in the near future. I believe the establishment of this institution is not only timely, but will go a long way in alleviating some of the problems which at the moment quite a number of people from the developing nations would love to further their education, but due to certain constraints, basically economic, being introduced by sponsors and made by the nations where they would love to go had become a near impossibility. And therefore, for the head of nations of the Commonwealth to set and decide, I think that they not only realize as a fact the relevance of education in the development of mankind, but probably have thought of a solution without a serious rupture 
of diplomatic relations between nations which in the absence of this would definitely have affected the would have been beneficiaries of what had been before the venues for such education development. Due to the economic situation in the world today, different nations of the world have to come up with policies towards arresting the deteriorating economic situations of their respective nations. And therefore, one cannot grudge such nations for taking steps towards the betterment of already the very bad economic situations which globally have become a phenomenon which each and every nation has to grapple with and with different strategies of so doing. And I believe the College of Learning now established will fill the gap that has been so created and in terms of cost and conveniences, I think it will be a lot more than the practice that had been, where you find even people at very advanced ages had to abandon their families where they can't afford going with them of the shores of their respective <coughs> nations with a view to bettering their education. But now with this distant learning process, I am with a firm belief that one, the rich, will be wider and probably deeper than it had been, and the recipients would be a lot more than it had been in the some past. As you might have probably noticed, you have as a Nigerian representative, Anhaj Hafizwali, who is very much well known in the education sector in this country, and who for years had been the director of the National Teachers Institute, and it is his credit that whatever achievement had been made in that institute had been due to his efforts and that of his management staff in that institute. So we sincerely hope that the good work he has established and the reputation he has established, which among others warranted the government to approve of his accountment to that institute, you'll find most valuable. And we sincerely hope by the time he would have finished and done that institute, you would have found in him a worthy ambassador of the Nigerian people and the Nigerian government. Dr. Bunza has just assumed office as his successor. He was at one time a commissioner of education in Sokoto State, and we hope that with him there, the linkages will still be sustained. And we hope that, as rightly pointed out, that you too have been here, is to find precisely how it had been over the years with the other NTI. He will be very much positioned to give you the necessary direction and whatever it were. But to the days when indigenous of the state would very much share the joy of the efforts you are putting it together, and we sincerely hope and by the time the Institute of Commenced Operation, Operation, the proponents of us here would love to see the impact of such in our midst. As we go around the state <coughs> and probably interact with the people, I sincerely hope you will pick up a lesson or two on what areas of cooperation will be availed between your institute and the government and people of the state. Once more, on behalf of the government and people of the state, I would like to most sincerely welcome you in, and I sincerely hope that this may not be the very first and last of such visits to this part of the country. I thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you. <laughs>
Royal Highness, the Emir of Zaria, councillors of the Zaria Emirate Council, the visiting, uh, visiting President of the Commonwealth of Lani, Dr. James A. Maraj, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to be at the Emir's Palace today despite the postponement of the earlier visit which was scheduled. I would like to seize this opportunity to formally apologize to His Highness for the earlier postponement. This was due to the events in the country at that time, which led to the postponement of the visit by the President of the Commonwealth of Lani. I'm happy to say today we have got the President of the Commonwealth of Lani, Dr. James A. Maraj, and his entourage, al Haj Hafiz Wali, and Mr. John Quigley with him, who felt it is an opportune that the Emir had agreed to receive us, and hence this courtesy visit. We are grateful. I now wish to introduce Dr. Ames Maraj to His Highness the Emir of Zaria. Your Highness, distinguished councillors, colleagues, friends. I have the honor, Your Highness, to pay our respects to you and to your council on what has become for me a very special occasion. Our visit to Nigeria on this occasion arises from the decision taken by heads of government, Commonwealth heads of government, some two years ago to create a new international organization with headquarters in Canada. The purpose of that organization is to try and increase the access to education and improve the quality of education for all the people in the Commonwealth. And to do so using distance education techniques. We are here, Your Highness, to hold discussions with the government and with the leaders of various institutions to see in what ways we can join hands in improving the educational provisions in Nigeria. I should like to take the opportunity to congratulate Nigeria on its achievements and to say that there is much in this country from which the other countries in the region can benefit. There's also a great deal from which other countries in the Commonwealth can benefit. It is my honor and privilege on behalf of myself, my counselors, and the people of the area to welcome you very warmly to my palace in particular and Zaria in general. We are very much delighted that we have found time to pay a courtesy call on me. This is indeed an honor to me and to the entire people of Zaria. Your current visit to Nigeria is very much welcome and we feel very much delighted that you are going around to see what we have, especially in the field of education. Nigeria as a developing country is spending a lot of money in education. But whatever amount of money we spend, we are still unable to provide uh, enough education to our students. Your organization, I'm sure, will be very useful in solving part of our problems. That is, if your organization can arrange to establish a proper link in the field of higher education and even in the field of in-service training of other students who are unable to get uh, into uh, learning among 
the students of Commonwealth. I do hope that after your tour, when you study what we have, we will benefit from your enormous ideas in the field of education. We look forward very much in a very short uh, distance when your organization will make a concrete arrangement for exchange of students throughout the Commonwealth countries. By doing so, our system of education will be very much similar and will be in a position to inculcate unity among Commonwealth uh, nations. I wish to thank you once more for finding time to call on me. I wish you a very successful short tour in Nigeria and we do hope that we'll see much of you here so that we can we shall continue to benefit from your experience. Thank you very much for coming. Vice Chancellors of Nigerian Universities had the privilege to sit on the Council of ACU in London, um, and even now we have a seat there. So I think it's a welcome idea to have you visit here uh, so that we can renew acquaintances and uh, hopefully further, uh, develop further cooperation. Uh, strategies between our two institutions. You are most welcome and I hope you have a pleasant stay in Nigeria and uh, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us for further details. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, perhaps I could uh, begin by thanking you for the cordiality of your welcome. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues and myself, and also perhaps on behalf of uh, people from the Federal Ministry who are also accompanying us. As a former Vice Chancellor myself um, in the South Pacific, with very strong connections to the Association of Commonwealth Universities, having served on its council on a number of occasions, 
Uh, I'm well aware of the uh, <coughs> extremely high reputation which this university enjoys internationally. And if I may, I should like to con congratulate you on the uh, progress which this university has made, not only in terms of its international reputation, but the service that is provided nationally here in Nigeria. I think that it might be useful if I uh, perhaps gave you a, a brief uh, introduction to the way the Commonwealth of Learning has developed since the earliest consultations. Um, you will recall, of course, that the the stimulus for setting us up at all uh, arose from the frustrations over the introduction of economic fees and fewer students being able to go overseas. I think because of that, um, people who have not uh, been consistently involved in the evolution uh, make the assumption that we are an institution of higher education. You will remember at Perth, at the 75th uh, anniversary of the ACU, that the original suggestion for a Commonwealth University did not really fly. Um, academic colleagues, no doubt recalling the experience of the United Nations University, did not quite see the need for uh, a Commonwealth University. So that from the earliest uh, beginnings, with a focus on higher education, I think I'm obliged to uh, explain that our mandate is uh, rather wider. Um, it was thought at one time that the Commonwealth of Learning would almost be a network of higher education institutions. And there are places in the Commonwealth where that model still lingers in people's minds. So that if we do things that are different, it might even be concluded that we have lost our way. Uh, for that reason, I think it is important to clarify that the mandate uh, which we have received uh, is one that focuses on the development of human resources using distance education. And I'm sure you will agree that the development of human resources is not necessarily the prerogative of higher education institutions. Because the members of the Commonwealth of Learning are the member countries of the Commonwealth, we are expected to respond to the priorities as those are laid down by governments. So that if individual governments feel that the priorities they wish to have addressed relate to technical vocational education, or literacy, or women in development, then the Commonwealth of Learning is obliged <coughs> to make its genuflections in that regard. And as you well know, as an experienced Vice Chancellor, even national universities from time to time have had for reasons of survival to do that. I used to say, uh, when I was a Vice Chancellor, dealing with 14 separate governments, that Often, if we do not do what the governments require us to do, we shan't survive long enough to do what we want to do. And I think there is more than a grain of truth in that. We are therefore um, working on a number of fronts, and our own structure uh, provides for a focus on distance education. My own view is that there's a fair amount of confusion uh, across the Commonwealth on what is distance education. Um, so much of the effort 
which universities have put into distance education has been modeled on the British Open University that I think we really have to clarify in our own minds e each of these. But I am not here, Vice Chancellor, to, to run a seminar on, on distance education. I'm here to say that we are a, an independent, autonomous international organization. We are not part of the Commonwealth Secretariat. We have the freedom, as universities have the freedom, to work with each other. I happen to hold the view, as many of my colleagues do, that no country is going to be able to meet the demands for greater access to education, including higher education. No, indeed, are we going to be able to improve the quality of what we're offering if we rely only on the conventional system? as resources are getting harder and harder. And even if we had the financial resources, the question of staff, libraries, laboratories, and so on, would make it extremely difficult. So I think there is a case for a greater use of distance education. And your university, of course, is a pioneer in that regard. You have over many years. Uh, one cannot but be impressed um, one of the reasons that makes me particularly happy to be here, for example, is that the model you have described is precisely the model which I use in my own university, where for each of the faculties, we had an institute which was concerned with the outreach function. And we had a number of centers which also cut across these. I believe that there is tremendous scope here for uh, closer work. I understand that the Ministry of Education uh, is proposing the creation of a network in Nigeria of the institutions concerned with distance education. One of the basic premises that heads of government operated on was that there does exist in the Commonwealth a considerable amount of materials and expertise. And that if only we could mobilize some of this, then each of us wouldn't have to start from scratch. If, therefore, in your own developments, we're able to facilitate your at least reviewing materials with a view to uh, broadening the range of your offerings or perhaps deepening them, then that is a, a service that we are in a good position to follow. I have with me my colleague uh, John Quigley, who was the director responsible for technology and telecommunications, has a particularly crucial role to play in strengthening the distance education dimensions. And there are some ideas that uh, we will be discussing with the ministry later this week. Uh, this is, uh, Director of African Programs, and also with responsibility for information services. You probably remember Professor Ram Reddy, who was Vice Chancellor of Indira Gandhi, who is Vice President, and who has responsibility for training and for Asian programs. Dennis Irvin, who is an old colleague of yours, is, uh, who has worked in Nigeria for some time, and was formerly Vice Chancellor of Guyana. Dennis is head of uh, Caribbean programs and materials acquisition and development. It's interesting. He, he was a teacher, you know. Yes, yeah, that's right. It's still going strong. It's still going strong. Yes. <laughs> if you if you join the Commonwealth of Learning, the, the, you tend to have a, you, you tend to have a new lease on life. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this has certainly been Dennis's experience. I'm sure it will be Hafiz's experience as well. So let me assure you, Vice Chancellor, that it's. Uh, I, I do not say this for reasons of courtesy only. Um, it is a, a great satisfaction to me because of my own background to be once more in, in, in the university f framework and to say that I have uh, um, 
great deal of respect and regard for what has been achieved here. I think within the framework <coughs> of a network of institutions, there must be a major role for this university. And if uh, the Commonwealth of Learning can help you, uh, both in the development of the institution and in, in serving this country, and perhaps lending from your many talents to the region, uh, if not the continent, and indeed other parts of the Commonwealth, then I believe that by working together, perhaps, we might leave the world a little bit better than we found it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> I believe in, in these two areas, uh, technical education, communication, and African studies, uh, we have a lot to do. Uh, one program that readily comes to our mind is that we are trying to establish a department of communication, uh, communication, mass communication. Mass communication. Uh, that is an area that, uh, it is mass communication, so it means it has to be uh, distantly mass uh, educated. You know, that's an area that... Uh, and talking about technology and communication, the world is really getting... getting uh, the whole world is getting into a society. And if we are not careful, we will be left out of the society. Uh, this is a realization which some of us are aware. But a lot of uh, our people are not fully aware. The world is now really getting into a world society of communication. Uh, the kind of network that we know exists between Europe, Canada, America, Japan, uh, and some other countries that does not exist here uh, is frightening. Uh, somebody said in a meeting in Rio de Janeiro in 1988 that if we are not careful, in the next 25 years, the world will change completely. And those who do not change the, uh, who do not uh, join the race, would be left behind. Where are you going to be on the margins? <laughs> the, whole, <laughs> the whole problem of the third world, yes. the whole business of South South. Exactly. And so on. South South. I think we have a problem, and I hope your institute will find a solution somehow. Well, I think we might manage together, mm. because neither you nor we can do it alone. Thank you. Yes. find it uh, useful. I would be delighted to, to refresh my memory on the, some of the things that we've so, been able to do here. So one of, this, uh, one of the books is for you personally and the other one, one for the institution. Right. We can browse through and see what areas we will That's very kind indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. That's okay. I, I would like to acquire uh, quest of the University, Amadabelli University. Oh, yes. Uh, this is the Northern Knot. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps you would like to have it in your yes. office? Yes, thank you very much indeed. I, I've almost become a graduate of Amadabelli. Uh, right. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Very kind. Thank you.